All right, so let's look at question 37. Uh, question 37 is a buffer question, so you have to remember the pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the conjugate over the weak acid. So as long as these concentrations are equal, then that means that your pH is going to be equal to your pKa. Um, so it's giving you some choices right here, and it's asking which one will have a pH of approximately 3. So basically, and you also have some Ka values. Um, so you would probably like to keep these concentrations the same and have something that has a pKa value of close to 3. Well, it gives you Ka values. Well, if you take the log of something, um, basically just let's look at these. I've got 8.3 times 10 to the negative fourth, so I know that the number is somewhere in between 1 times 10 to the negative fourth and 10 to the negative fourth, but really this is the same thing as saying 1.3 or 1.0 times 10 to the negative third. So if I take the negative log of this number, I'm going to get a pH of 4 here. So if I take the log, negative log here, it's going to be 3. So the pH is somewhere in between, or the pKa rather, is somewhere in between 3 and 4. And it's asking for a pH of 3. Well, if I do the same thing for this one, my pH is going to be somewhere between 11 and 10. So it should not have anything to do with this one. We're probably going to want to pick this one because the pKa value is going to be close to 3. So that means I can eliminate this one. I can eliminate this one. All right, so... Now we need to look at this and, oh, okay, it gives us acetic acid, but then it says 50 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Okay, so really what you need to remember is that hydroxide will react to the acid component. So it's going to react to acetic acid. Or this isn't actually, that's not acetic acid, but, you know, it's a weak acid. Okay, so it's going to react to that, it's going to make water, and then it will make its conjugate. Oh, its conjugate, which is C3H5O3 minus. All right, so it will make this. Well, every one of these that you have, you're going to reduce this by one and then add one of these. So your base is really going to make this. All right, so it says that I'm adding 50 milliliters of 0.1 sodium hydroxide. Basically what's happening is it's going to react half of this and create that. So even though I'm starting off with 100 milliliters of a 0.1 molar solution of this, this is going to react and make half of this turn into that. What will end up happening is I will have this and this in the same concentration because that base is going to react to this and make this. So I added half the amount and then I make the same amount of my acid at that time. All right, so um, you have two options. You can have this or you can have this. Um, really if I take this and put it with this the hydroxide is not going to react to this. This is a base component. My best option here is B. So I picked this one because I'm looking for an acid that has a Ka or pKa close to 3 or 4 which one, this one does and I needed equal amounts of my weak acid to my conjugate base and then the sodium hydroxide is going to create my conjugate base here. So this is going to be choice B. Alright, so let's look at the next one. The next one has an acid strength question. So uh, which of the following statements identifies a stronger acid and correctly identifies a factor that contributes to it being a stronger acid? Okay, so Without even looking at any of the choices, if I look at the structures, the only difference is one has one more oxygen. Well, technically, more oxygens 
will equal stronger acids. Okay, so more oxygens you have, the stronger acid you're going to have. So automatically, I know this one should be the stronger acid, just knowing that. So I can get rid of C and D. All right, so um, any time that we add an oxygen or any electronegative atom to an acid, what ends up happening is I pull the electrons more towards the, the conjugate base or the everything that's not the hydrogen. And basically, those electronegative atoms stabilize the other thing, the other thing that's not the acid or not the H. So adding oxygens and adding more electronegative atoms will stabilize the conjugate base, so everything that's not the H that's going to be donated, and that creates a stronger acid because that makes it easier for something else like water to come along and take that hydrogen off. All right, so it should be choice B because the additional oxygen stabilizes the conjugate base. And remember, when you remove the hydrogen, what you're left with is the conjugate base. Um, and it can't be this one is a stronger acid because molecules experience stronger London dispersion. Oh, well, uh, that, that's, that doesn't really have anything to do with acid strength here. So choice B is the best one. Right, so 39, if equal masses of the falling compounds undergo combustion, which will yield the greatest mass of CO2? Okay, so um, when we combust the, anything um, in oxygen, you're going to get CO2 in water. Well, the C from the CO2 comes from the carbon and the hydrocarbon. I can eliminate one of these choices because one of these only has one carbon, the other ones have six. So I'm only going to be able to make one carbon dioxide from one of these. So um, my choices now are this one, this one, and this one. So basically, if you're starting with equal masses, you're going to get more carbon dioxide if you have a greater percentage of carbon. So without even doing any kind of math, I know that I've got the same number of carbons but in the other molecules, I've got more atoms of hydrogen and oxygen. So my choice is A. Because I have a greater percentage of carbon, I'm going to be able to make more moles of carbon dioxide with that component. All right, so um, the reaction system represented above is an equilibrium, which the following will decrease the amount of CaO. All right, so um, let's look for choices I can eliminate. Well, if I remove CO2, so let's say that I take some of this out. Well, Les Shetley, his principle says that if I remove something, I'm going to replace it. So it's going to shift back to make the CO2 again, which ends up making more CaO. So it can't be that because that would actually increase the CaO. All right, removing some of the calcium carbonate, which is a solid. Okay, anytime that you remove or add a solid, it doesn't matter because the fact of it is, is it's not included in the equilibrium expressions. So it cannot be choice D either. All right, so um, if I look at choice A, increasing the volume of the reaction vessel at a constant temperature, well, delta H is positive, which means that my energy is a reactant. Oh, oh, this is dealing with the volume. I'm sorry. All right, so um, we're looking at the volume. So if I increase the volume, that decreases the pressure. Well, Les Atlee's principle says I want to make more pressure essentially, so I need more gas particles. So the only way to get more gas particles is to again go to the product side and make more CO2 which would make more of this. It can't be that either. It has to be this and that's because it is an endothermic reaction which means that energy 
is required to make the reaction happen. So if I lower the temperature, that means I need to go back and replace the energy. So it's going to go backwards, and then I'm going to get rid of CaO when I do that. All right, so let's look at this. All right, so which solution is most suitable to maximize the yield? Sometimes I like to just start with a question and then go back and read all the stuff. Okay, so to maximize the yield, um, a solution of a weak monoprotic acid that has a concentration between 0.2 and 0.3. So we need the concentration of acid to be between these. And it's a monoprotic acid, so it's just some acid with one hydrogen to donate. Uh, 400 milliliter samples at different concentrations are titrated with this. So we're titrating it with 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide. And we're trying to find which one has a concentration between 0.2 and 0.3. Okay, so it's a titration question. All right, so what you need to do is you need to figure out how many moles of base you added. <laughs> okay, you need to figure out how many moles of base you've added, and it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So once you know how many moles of base you've added, you know how many moles of hydrogen ions you started with, and then you can figure out the molarity because you need two things for molarity. You need moles and you need volume, and you have the volume. It says 100 milliliters, so you need the number of moles of H. So let's start with D. Um, D, we're starting with four, 200 milliliters of a 0.2 sodium hydroxide. So 0.2 liters times 0.2 moles. So that's going to be 0.04 moles. All right, so right here, if I have 0.04 moles of hydroxide, and that was necessary to titrate this, I have 0.04 moles of my hydrogen ion. Well, I need molarity, so I'm going to divide that by the 100 milliliters, 0.1. So that's going to be 0.4. So if I move the decimal point, it would be 1, 2 times, right? So that's going to be 4. And then 0.1, let's move it two times. Or, I'm sorry, just once. So it's 4 out of 1, so it's, four, it's still 4. But then because I move the decimal point two times here and one time here, I need to move it one more time. Basically, when you divide by decimals, your decimal gets smaller, or you have less decimal spaces. All right, so my molarity here is 0.4 for D. Well, that's too high. But I've started in the right direction, so now I can do C, which is a little bit less. So now I'll do C. I need to figure out how many moles of base I added. So 0.115 liters times 0.2 gives me 0.023. Moles. Okay, so that's how many moles of acid I have. Divided by 0.1, which would give me 0.23. Well, that's in between 0.2 and 0.3. And then if I go to 75, that's probably going to be too small. So that means that it is going to be solution C here. All right, so let's look at this one. This is a kinetics question. All right, so it's asking for the rate law. It gives you the mechanism. So whenever we have a mechanism, we're going to look at the slow step only. So in the slow step, I have two components. I have Cl, and then I have O3. Cl to the first, O3 to the first because of the coefficients. All right, so. Um, that should be choice B. And then I know some of you would probably be like, oh, well, CL is um, a catalyst. Well, CL can still be included in 
the rate law. Catalysts can be included in the rate law. What cannot be included in the rate law are intermediates. Oh, intermediates. No. Catalysts can be included, though, so it should be B. All right, let's look at 43. All right, so 43, which of the following reaction energy profiles best corresponds to the proposed mechanism? Okay, so first of all, this mechanism has two steps, and it also tells me that it's an exothermic reaction. So it has two steps, and it's exothermic. All right, so when I have an exothermic reaction, that means the products have less energy than the reactants. So let's see if I can eliminate anything based on that and I can. I can eliminate choice D because the products are higher, so that's an endothermic reaction. So let's get rid of that. And I also know it's two steps. So this, every time I have a hump, that's one step, so it can't be this one. It's either this one or this one. So now, if I go back and look at my mechanism, um, this is my slow step. My, so my first step is slow, my second step is fast which means that my first step probably has a higher activation energy. So the hump should be higher for the first step, so it's choice B. This one is almost the same height, so it's really not the best option. All right, so let's look at 44. All right, the proposed mechanism can be written in more, a more general form as shown above. Uh, species other than chlorine can decompose O3. Which of the following chemical species is most likely to decompose O3? Well, gives me some options. If I look, though, bromine has something in common with chlorine because it's in the same group. It has the same number of valence electrons, so it's probably going to behave in a very similar fashion in a chemical reaction. Just like all the alkali metals, when you put it into water, it makes hydrogen gas and... Um, a metal hydroxide. If it's in the same group, the same family, has the same number of valence electrons, more than likely it's going to behave in a very similar fashion of chemical reactions that are of the same nature. All right, so. Um, a solution of a salt of a weak acid is added to a solution of another weak acid. Um, which of the following species is the strongest base? Oh, okay. First thing, let's identify our acids and bases. Um, well, HX becomes X minus. It lost a hydrogen, so that's an acid. And the acid becomes its conjugate base. Well, then if this is the acid, this is the base. And the base becomes a conjugate acid. So it says, which one is the strongest base? Uh, well, I can eliminate any acids then. That's gone, and that's gone. So now we have these two options. Well, K is greater than 1, which means it's very product-driven, which means that these things on this side are stronger, and these are weaker. Basically, if these, if K, A, or if K, was less than one, it would be more reactant driven, which would mean that my products would be stronger and my reactants would be weaker. All right, so my stronger base in this case would be D because it's one of the reactants. All right, so let's look at number 36. Um, at equilibrium, which of the following is true about the concentration of the gases? Okay, so it looks like we're going to be doing an ice table. So we have X plus 2Q produces R and Z, and they're all gases. All right, so initially it says that one mole sample of X and one mole sample of Q, so one mole for each one, zero for my reactants. It's 10 out of 10 liters, so technically um, it should be one-tenth 
right? So for the change, well, I have zero products, so I've got to make those. So I'm going to be adding. And for my reactants, I'm going to be subtracting. So minus 2x for q because of the coefficient. All right, so at equilibrium, we have this. One-tenth minus 2x, x, and x. All right, so which of the following is true at equilibrium? Well, without even really like looking at anything else, I know that r and z should be equal to each other. So r and z should be equal. So it could be this one. Um, it's definitely not d, though, because it's not equal to Q and X, so it can't be D. Um, now, just knowing my K value right here, my K value is very large, so that means that I should have more products than anything. My products should be at a higher concentration. So R and Z should be higher than the concentration of Q, and that's true. So it should be choice C. Choice C is our best option here. All right, so let's look at this diagram. I've seen this one before in the notes. Um, so which of the following is true regarding the forces between the atoms when their inter-nuclear distance is x? So this point right here, the lowest amount of potential energy here. Okay, so... Basically, as you have two atoms come together, they're attracted to each other. The electrons are attracted to the nucleus and so on. As they come together, the closer they get, the two nuclei actually start to repel each other. And what will end up happening is they find this happy medium where their repulsions are minimized and their attractions are maximized. And at that distance, we have lowered the amount of potential energy. Well, the amount of potential energy at that point is the bond strength. So how much energy it takes to break up the two atoms. And that distance is equal to the bond length because that's the perfect distance at which we have lowered the potential energy and maximized our attraction and minimized the repulsions. So the best option here that meets that is choice A. All right, so let's look at 48. Uh, 48 is a little tricky because it gives you all this data and you're like, oh, I'm probably gonna be solving for the rate law, but you're not. It says um, in trial two, in trial two, um, which of the reactants would be more consumed or would be consumed more rapidly? Oh, okay, so rate law doesn't matter here. Really what matters is just the data in trial two and that is it. All right, so if I look at it, y is half the amount of x. Well, the thing that's going to get consumed first should be the thing that's in the lower amount. So y is going to be consumed first because it's going to, um, because the rate of the disappearance will be double than that of x. So every time that I use one mole of x, I'm going to be using um, up some of my, some more of my Y. So it's choice D here. It's just asking you to look at trial two here. And actually, if you go through and you solve for this, like if you go and solve for the rate law, which you might have done if you saw this automatically, and this might actually help you eliminate um, one of the other choices if you went through and you solve for the rate law you would see that y is actually first order so if I were to do that let me show you um, if I were to do that okay x here is doubling and the rate here is going up by a factor of four so actually x is to the second and then y if I look right here y doubles and then this also doubles, which means it's to the first. So it's actually not to the second order, it's to the first. So it can't be that option. If that helps you, you can do that too.
All right, so let's look at this one. Oh, this is chromatography. Um, basically, your solvent will run up your stationary phase, and basically it runs up the stationary phase depending on how attracted it is either to the, the solvent, what's moving, or the stationary phase. Okay, so it says the surface of the paper is moderately polar. So if it's attracted to the paper, so if it's polar, it's going to be lower on the paper. It's attracted to it. If it is more attracted to the solvent, it'll run with the solvent and go further up the paper. So if I go through my choices, if I look at A, it says X has a larger molar mass than Y does. If X has a larger molar mass than Y does, how did it get further up the paper? That can't be true. Um, so sometimes they will move based on mass, but they're definitely not going to move further if they're heavier. All right, so I know that my paper is more polar. Hexane is definitely nonpolar. So if it's moving up the paper further, so if it's going at a higher distance, then it's more attracted to the hexane. If it's more attracted to the paper, it stays on the paper. It likes to stay exactly where it is on the paper. So component Y is down further, which means it's more polar. X is up more, so that means it's probably more nonpolar than polar. So if I look at my choices, Y is more polar. That's true because it stayed with the paper. If it's more attracted to the solvent, it runs further up the paper. If it's more attracted to the paper, it stays further down on the paper. Oh, and our last question. Okay, our last question is one of those weird, funny things that College Board kind of threw on there. This is my advice. And honestly, the best way to do this is just memorize it. Okay, so UV, um, whenever you apply UV to a substance, Basically, it excites the electrons, and the electrons will move up in energy, and that's called an electronic transition. So UV is associated with electronic transitions. IR is usually associated with molecular vibrations. So the UV rays will basically like when you put a sample in an IR spectrum, it vibrates the molecules. It vibrates the bonds in between the molecules. And then microwaves deal with molecular rotation. And I really wish there was a better way to go about this, but at this point, this is one of those things that it's on the test, apparently. Just memorize it. Microwaves deal with molecular rotation. Infrared deals with molecular vibration, and then electronic transition is UV and Vis spectrum.